This video was produced to introduce basic information about the operation of standard equipment, machinery, and tools found in a metal shop. A video cannot replace in-person instruction. Watching a video does not replace experience, and this video does not introduce every possible situation or circumstance involved in using equipment successfully and safely. I do not assume liability for damage or injury resulting from the information this video provides. Continuing to watch this video affirms your agreement to waive any claim of liability you may have against me by implementing any procedure or recommendation contained here. Shops are inherently dangerous places full of equipment that can cause injury if not used correctly. You must use care and pay attention when using equipment for your own safety and for the safety of those around you. Dress appropriately to work with equipment, wear shoes that protect your feet and clothes that cover your skin, remove all loose clothing and jewelry, wear eye protection at all times. If you do not feel confident using a piece of equipment, don't. Ask for help or guidance from someone with more experience. Underneath these wooden covers are the most precious surfaces in the metal shop. That's why they're covered. This is not a table for eating lunch on or storing stuff on. This is a protective cover. So these should always be clear of stuff. And underneath them, if you take the covers off, are incredibly beautiful, very precious, extremely accurate flat surfaces. <laughs> and my notes. There are two materials that surface plates are made out of, cast iron and granite. The cast iron ones are a real feat of manufacturing craftsmanship, and it's worth examining them more closely. Older ones that are really well made are cast and then naturally aged. They're just left, sometimes buried in the earth for a year, for two years, for five years, so that the casting can stabilize and any movement that it wants to have is removed. And then the surface is put on it by hand, by rubbing, with a master plate and grit in between. Because if you clamp this in a machine and machine the surface flat, you're introducing stress with the clamp. And when you unclamp it, that stress is released and it will no longer be flat. The granite ones are also finished by hand. The reason we have two surfaces is the granite ones are a little more common today because they require a little bit less care to make. Also, they will age a little bit better in a high use environment because when you damage them, they spall, they chip whereas the iron ones can develop a burr which gets in the way of their working. So the iron surface plates require a little bit more care over time and a little bit of maintenance to keep them in perfect shape. That's why these always stay covered. So if you're going to use one, you take the cover off and use it, and then you put the cover right back on. You shouldn't ever leave this just uncovered, and you shouldn't put anything on it when it's uncovered that isn't designed to go on it. Their smoothness is rated per square inch, and they're supposed to have 21 high spots per inch. So very smooth surface. The first thing I always do is just give it a little wipe off because there's probably some dirt or dust on there that will get in between the things we're going to use. I'm going to do my demos on the cast iron one just to focus on that, but know that there are two. We also have smaller ones, which I'll add a picture of. And I'm going to include a picture of the bottom of this casting so you can see how much engineering goes in to making a stable surface. I'm also going to link to a video that explains the concept of how to get a flat surface because we think in our brains that it's really easy to accomplish. In fact, it's quite a challenge and the people who figured out how to make the first one uh, should get a prize. So I'm going to cover this one up. I'm going to move on. There are some additional tools you can use with the surface plate. This is a knee. It's been machined to a right angle. They generally come in matched pairs. Has a handle built in. Never put it down. Always establish contact at the edge and then slide it forward. So anytime you're putting anything on a surface plate, if you put it down, you have a chance of chipping it by hitting a corner into it or creating a burr. So if you start it at the edge, which is a little bit rounded over, and slide it on, you can move a knee on. You would use this if you want to transfer your flat surface, your completely smooth surface, to a right angle if you want to measure vertically. There's also a 45. And again, I'm going to start it on the corner and slide it in. I could put my work in this and then have things on 45 degree angles. So those are additional tools that we're going to look at using. The whole reason we have surface plates are to increase accuracy. You're going to have to establish for yourself in a metal shop how accurate you want to be. A human hair is three thousandths of an inch thick and we can actually measure that. 
Generally in this shop, we could work to a tolerance of twice that. It's about six thousandths of an inch. I work in a tolerance of about an eighth of an inch because I'm not good at measuring. So one of the things you have to do is decide what your goal is, how accurate you need to be to suit the project. And I would argue that all designers and all people who make things should do two things at once. Figure out what method of measuring suits your own personality and abilities and work to improve that, but also design pieces and situations that will allow you to measure that way successfully. So when I show you some of these measuring tools, I'm going to show you different levels of accuracy and I'll tell you where I fit into each of these. My apologies also to anyone who grew up using metric. This is not metric. And you will see why when we start to look at screws and threads and a little bit when we look at the micrometer and how measuring happens in a shop. I've taken the liberty of finding a piece of steel. I have filed the ends square. I've removed all the burrs. If you have a burr on your metal, you won't be able to establish an accurate contact with your reference surface. I've put dichem on the surface a blue coating so that when I scribe on here you'll be able to see it better. And we're going to do some things with that. So what I can do on the surface plate is transfer very accurate measurements onto this piece of metal. And I might use the knee to rest this up on its side so that I can do things up from that surface. I might use the 45 if I had to scribe something on a 45 degree angle, I could do that. The first thing we're going to do is take a tour of the different measuring devices that can be used on this. There's my favorite. This is what I learned to use on a surface plate. It has no measures. It has adjustable arm and a scribe. So you, you use a ruler to figure out where your height is and then you can scribe. So if I had my knee and my piece of metal and I wanted to scribe at a certain height, I'd figure out the height and then I would scribe. Super low tech, no numbers. So if I take my combination square and set this scribe so that it rests in the one inch mark, you have to have good knees to use this equipment. You have to be willing to get down on the ground. All right, there we go. This has a sharp point. This has a groove. I fit the sharp point into the groove at one inch. And now I can use that to scribe a line right into my metal at one inch. When you're scribing with any of these tools, you should pull. If you push, you're pushing the scribe into the metal and it will chatter and pot potentially also break. So I would pull against that. In sliding anything on the surface plate, if you feel any resistance, it means there's some dirt under there. This slides around beautifully because everything is perfectly flat. So if that's not happening, you've got a, you've got a problem. So nobody likes this tool except Matthew Bird. I love the simplicity of it. I love that it lets the ruler do the measuring and it's a scribe on a surface plate. But I don't think anybody else would suggest you use that. Another kind of surface gauge is a little bit more accurate because it has numbers up and down the ruler. You can move the scribe up and down and set it with extraordinary accuracy. So let's take a look at how that operates. I'm going to hope that you can see these numbers clearly enough and I will include a close-up on the screen so you can see what's happening. This surface gauge has a carriage that rides up and down and there are two knurled lock nuts that hold that in place. So if I set this right down on the bottom of the surface plate, it will read zero. You can look at the bottom and it's at zero, zero. If I want to scribe something at one inch, I can raise the carriage to close to one inch and tighten the upper lock nut. That holds the carriage in place, but allows me to use the micro adjuster to raise and lower the bottom of the carriage in a really controlled and accurate way. If you have bad vision, this is a problem. So 
I'm going to set the carriage close to one inch, and then I'm going to use the micro adjust to line up the zero with the one. Very, very exact. That's at one inch. And then I can use that to scribe on my metal. And again, I want to pull, not push. And you can see I've got a really clear, clean line through my blue die chem. You won't always be doing one inch. You might be doing any sort of decimal equivalent. Uh, and that's where understanding the vernier scale that makes this work is really important. I'm the last person in the world who should explain how to do that. I'm going to link to a video that does instead. It's quite basic and quite easy for everyone else to understand. Uh, I end up making sure that I'm doing things in hundredths, not thousandths, because to find hundredths on here is quite easy. To find thousandths requires care and thinking. Always handle this with two hands. Always have a hand on the base. I want to show you a third kind. This is the one a lot of students prefer because it has a completely different kind of readout. It has a dial. So it's essentially the same device. I'm going to lower this down with the crank. When it hits the deck, it's at zero. If you, if you turn this too far, you can see the base lifting up a little bit. So you want to make sure that doesn't happen. With everything just casually on the surface, you can then adjust the dial. You can reset it at zero. And that's how you zero this out. And then you can also press these two buttons, which zero out everything. Then as you turn the dial up, you get math. You get numbers. You, you get inches up. There's one and a half inches up. So that's the crude measurement, one and a half. I can go over here and make that exactly one and a half. I can then lock it and use it as a scribe. So this is the one most students use because there's less thinking and care involved. I don't like it because there are options involved. I have to reset zero carefully. Also, if you're bad at measuring, I recommend that you keep your ruler on hand because if you know you have to do, let's say, one and three quarter inches, you can get this up to one and three quarter inches, which is 1.7. There's 1.7, and then five more. Boom. I would just really quickly take my ruler and put it here and make sure I'm in the ballpark, because it's very easy for me to get confused and do 2.7 or some other number. I'm, anybody watching this who knows what they're doing is going to be laughing at how stupid I am, but I don't care. I'm proud. So there are three different surface gauges. There's variety. Everybody finds one they like best and sticks with that. There are multiples of this one, which is why most people end up liking it, because they don't have to wait for it. Think for a minute about your reference surface. If I filed this all beautiful and as square as I could, perhaps it's square. But if I measure everything from one side, it doesn't really matter if my edges are off a little bit. If I measure from one corner, if every measurement comes from one reference point, I will have accurate interior measurements. If I measure in from the outside, who knows? If I measure some things in from one side and some from the other, it's pretty guaranteed that they'll be off. If I measure some things from the bottom up and some things from the end in, I hand filed that end. So it's really likely that it will be wrong. So one of the things you'll want to do is make sure you're always measuring from the same edge. I would mark my corner and my edge. So just keep in mind that any mistake you make in measuring will be magnified each time you rely on that mistake for accuracy. Measuring from a reference point or reference edge will remove as much of that as possible. If I needed to scribe close to the edge, I wouldn't lay my piece on the table and then hope for the best. I would elevate it on parallels. These are machined parallels. They've been machined to a very exact size. And etched in the side of this one, it says 1 half by 1 and 1 eighth by 6 inches. So I could use it this way to elevate things 1 and an eighth inch, or this way to do it half an inch. But if I use a pair of these and put my work on it, I know exactly what this math is. So if I wanted to describe 1 eighth of an inch up from the edge, I would get 1 inch parallels, set my work on it, and set the surface gauge at one inch plus one eighth, one and an eighth inch. And then I could scribe around on here. So keep that in mind. Positioning your work in different ways can sometimes make transferring the measurements easier. 
Let's use this in concert to measure some things on here. This is a two inch piece of bar stock. If I need to drill holes half of an inch in from each side, I'm not going to measure half inch in from each side. I'm going to measure half an inch up from the bottom and then an inch and a half up from the bottom. So let's do that. I'm going to set my surface gauge at half an inch, which is 0.5. So again, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it close with the upper carriage, I'm going to get it exact with the lower carriage. I'm going to get my knee. A lazy person who didn't care about accuracy would scribe and flip the piece over and scribe again. But if you want to be truly accurate, I would leave it there and then I would reset my surface gauge at one and a half inches. And scribe again. Then I have a piece of metal with truly accurate information. When I'm done, I'm going to handle my tools with both hands, put them away where they go. I'm going to just clean this off with my hands a little bit, make sure it's completely free of dirt and metal, and I'm going to cover it up. This is one of the smaller surface plates. It also has a wooden lid. It's just as precious as the big ones. I can lift this one, so I've <laughs> chosen this to show you the bottom. And if you look at this, you can see the surface it has lots and lots of, of sort of fluctuations because it's been completely hand finished. So it guarantees that as you slide things over, you'll be riding on those high points and they're absolutely accurate. But you can see the marks of the hand finishing on here. If I turn it over, you can see this incredible web of cast iron that gives it its structure. And you can also see its number. That number has a date built into it. And that's a handy thing if you end up in the world of machinists and need to know. The date will tell you how old it is. And the older your surface plate is, probably the better made it was. So that's just something to keep in mind. And just like with the big ones, when I'm done, I'm covering that back up.